We're live. What's up? Nothing. It's Sunday and we're live and we're going to talk about nerdy science stuff today. Tonga. <laughs> I know. I I um, I spent my, you know, and the thing is I don't get to teach geology right now because I'm teaching bio and I have to tell you, I miss it. I miss my nerdy geo world. Bio is fine, but it's like ugh, ADP, boring, ATP, boring. <laughs> The geology of the Pacific Rim, not boring. <laughs> it's Lori. Look, it's Lori. What's up, bro? I know, Lori. How are you? We miss you. I miss you. Yeah. How are things in Minnesota? Is it cold there? That's a dumb <laughs> question. <laughs> I already know the answer to that. <laughs> hey, the is it not cold there? Uh, it's always cold. Well, I don't know. Yeah, it's pretty much always cold this time. And I have noticed. I, I do keep an eye, a close eye, on your temperature. Um, because you know, I'm a, because I'm a nerd. So I, am. Um, I've been looking at your negative 23 and 25 below, and I don't, I don't really love that. Um, she says things are cold. Very it's cold. Everything is cold. Like you can't get warm. Like there's no getting warm. No, no. So, um, I, I was, it is, it's almost February. It is. I am, I, you know, we had five Mondays in January. For school this year, which is the stupidest. It's so stupid when you have five Mondays. Five Saturdays. five Saturdays. Five Saturdays, please, not five Mondays, but no, five Mondays. So yeah, I'm looking forward to the fact that it's February, and I don't say that very often because February, I, I do not like the month of February. I like February less than I like January. Mm -hmm. So, but I'm just looking forward to the the fact that. I went to Menards yesterday to buy birdseed, and there was all kinds of gardening stuff right up front. So Ugh. it's like, it's coming! So. You know what I miss? Like, in February, years past, T, there was always TES, and we don't um, have that anymore, and I miss that, because it was a good way to break up February. Do you think we should try and start that again? For those of you that don't know, my sister and I are having this little private conversation uh, in, in the public world. Sorry, we will get to our presentation. But do you think we should start that again? Um, give me next year. Give me the year to think about it. Okay. Um, maybe. Maybe. So, I know it would be fun again. And I keep thinking that there's something we could do to that and like spice it up to get the young people in. But then I'm like, I don't really want young people there. I don't really I want young people. Young people. I think, I think our, we were wrong to think we should put young people in. We needed to market hard to people in senior, active senior living communities. We needed just to get more old people. Exactly. That's what we needed. I'm like, that's our demographic. Us, our age and up. I'm like, there's nothing wrong with that. It's like, there's nothing wrong with getting the oldies because old people can be fun too. Right. So, lifelong learners. We want lifelong life learners. That's, that's what we're looking for. So I'm like, everybody would like, you know, spare income and spare time. Yeah. So yeah, we should uh, reach out to the Ralph A. McMullen Center up up north and and maybe start doing that up again. Because I would agree. You know, and the thing is what I'm noticing, like, Kalamazoo Public doesn't have a midwinter break, which I got to tell you, they need to, because we have this stretch that goes essentially from January 3rd all the way through until uh, March 24th. And it, I got to tell you right now, we're all dropping like flies right now. It is br This is a brutal stretch. So, yeah. Anyway. Uh, brutal. Uh, so it's nice to break it up with things like talking about geologic disasters, such as the Tonga volcano. So there you go. the good news is that... Um, it really is. Uh, yeah, I know, Lori, right? Gross is right. Yeah, it's Gross. just ridiculous that we don't have a single day that you could call. That's why I'm like so hard praying for a snowstorm this week. But like I said, I don't think it's going to I don't think it's going to catch us. But anyway, say, we're gonna either, here or there, it could be worse. Um, we could have gone through an, an environmental disaster such as the one in Tonga that happened uh, in the middle part of, uh, of January. So should we talk about that? Let's talk about Tonga. Okay, well, you know, we haven't really done a cool science nerd festival in a while, so I thought it would be uh, it would be interesting to to do that for this because we have we've we've done a lot of uh, fluff pieces, if you will, movie reviews, stuff like that. And honestly, I, I love doing those as as much as anything. I could talk about pop culture stuff all the time. Oh, I know, Lori. Um, for those of you that don't know what Lori's talking about, she said, "I am sad that Mr. Tonga won't be at the Olympics. Uh, he was their flag bearer." Uh, I have a picture of him in this. Ooh, yeah, he, he, yes, you do. And he is gorgeous. Exactly. I was like, yes. like, could look at that all day long. Yeah. Yeah. And it was like, 
I want to go to there. So, but anyway, for those of you that, that don't know what happened, um, there was a really massive volcanic eruption um, on so one of the islands of, of Tonga. And we'll talk about that. And we'll take you through a little bit of the history of Tonga. And then I will take you through the geology of Tonga and the unusual nature of this particular volcanic eruption. Um, shall we? Let us. Okay. Okay. Uh, after you. There he is. There he is right there, Mr. Tonga. Yeah. There he is. I know. I was like, I was like, I need pictures that that show the the wonder and beauty of Tonga, and that was the first thing that showed up. I was like, dang, that's pretty beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, they got some nice scenery. So, um, well, they did. Um, anyway, uh, it's a Polynesian country in the South Pacific Ocean, and I don't think we realize here in America, in the Midwest, how absolutely mammoth the Pacific Ocean is. So you know, you're like, oh, it's in the Pacific Ocean. Ooh, ooh. Huge. Yes, Jay. I didn't realize it until I flew to Hawaii. And then you're like, holy, holy shit, this thing's huge. Right. Right. Like, so we flew for like five hours and we weren't even halfway across the damn thing. Exactly. Yeah. I'm mean, like, Hawaii, it makes Hawaii look like, a, you know, a coastal island. You know, that's, <laughs> that's why. So it's, it's very isolated. It's an archipelago. And Jenny's going to talk more about archipelagos in a, in a few minutes of 169 islands. And 36 of these islands are inhabited. Now, the first inhabitants of, um, of the Tongas were, uh, it's debated between 3,000 and 2,500 years ago, but most of the resources I found said 2,500 years ago, give or take. So that seems to be about when it was first inhabited. Um, the people that first inhabited were um, Lap Lapiti, and this is actually a prehistoric um, Austronesian people, so they think they probably came from Australia out towards Tongo. So they went, they went east towards the Tongan islands and found them. And actually at one point, um, Tonga was quite the uh, imperialistic um, nation uh, before the, you know, Westerners found it. Uh, so it was, uh, it, they were really good at like going to other people's islands, kicking the crap out of them and taking over. So they were quite the, weird. here's my question. What prompts you to leave the Australian continent and be like, I'm just going to take this boat out there and see what's out there. I'm like, man. And, and, and like, not just a boat, but like a big canoe. Like a rowboat. Yeah. Like yeah. A, like a, yeah. I assume it was because somebody was mad at somebody else and it was like, I can stay here and get murdered or I can go. I think I'll go. <laughs> yeah. Choices. I'm like, I'll just take my chances on the freaking Pacific. Exactly. Um, I'm like, they traveled, sure there. Well, they traveled in boats called the Tupuku. Am I saying that right, Lori? Tupu here, I'm going to put that on so everybody can see that. Okay. So Lori, uh, Lori uh, who is a uh, social studies teacher, genius. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, they were looking for resources. Okay. Like, like food. All right. Yeah. yeah because that enough. would, I, I, that would be my first question. Like you're going, what, where? Yeah. I was going to say, cause you know, Australia can be a bit of a um, hostile place. So I imagine, you know, maybe like there's more fish over here. Maybe they got more coconuts or, you know, something. I don't know. Don't it might, yeah, in my limited knowledge of the resources of the Pacific, I'm like, that is some, that's ambitious. That's all that I is ambitious. Like, but, but you are hungry. If you yeah. are getting into that ocean in a canoe, I'm sorry, a uh, tupuku uh -huh. and, uh, and going to just, you know, do whatever. So, yeah. yeah. Awesome. I, I, I was like, definitely there's a hint of desperation, you know, so. Agreed. Um, uh, this is an interesting thing about uh, Tonga is that it's a constitutional monarchy for its government. And it's the only one in that, uh, that those island areas that has a constitutional monarch. So they have a king. Sweet. Yeah, I, I think, uh, yes, the kingdom of Tonga, which I think is, uh, yes, um, you know, I think that's interesting. Yeah, so. yeah, I didn't know that. So I, I put a couple maps out so you can see kind of where Tonga was in comparison to like Australia or New Zealand. So if you, you know, you're getting in your tupuku. And you and your several of your bestest buddies are like paddling over. I mean, that's that's a that's a good haul. I mean, this year it looks like oh, it's not what you know. Like, eh, that's pretty. That's like that's far. That's far. That's, that's far. Yeah, that's like a thousand miles far. Like Fiji's the close, you know, is close, and that's like five hundred miles away. So exactly. That's so and then funny. I put up another map so we could kind of see like based on where the U.S. is and Hawaii, where you could see where Tonga was. And again, you get the idea that these are all like fairly close together. It is not. Tonga is remarkably isolated. And you could, like, you see, like, Hawaii, uh, Fiji, Tahiti, you know, those are all big tourist locations. But Tonga is not. I mean, it's got some beautiful, um, it's a beautiful island nation, you know, but um, they don't they don't get quite the amount of um, tourists that, like, go to Fiji or Tahiti or that sort of thing. 
Lori's uh, letting us know that their government was influenced by the French during uh, the times of colonization. I'm like, those French, they were in everything. I'm telling they you. Were, they were so crazy. Dipping their toe. I know. Yeah. Um, speaking of the French, uh, Anna and I were discussing uh, just, just this morning the movie, or was it last night? The morning, uh, the movie, The Last Duel. Oh, yeah. Um, which we should review that because that's a shockingly uh, good movie. Mm -hmm. BTW. So, yeah. yeah. Again, set in France. Set in France, I know. So uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna take over our presentation, and we're gonna right. talk about some of the geology because, like I said, the the um the, the crux of this is the volcanic eruption that took place. So uh, kind of got started just a little bit, started showing some activity on January 14th, and then just blew its lid on the 15th. So uh, as Ann said, um, Tonga is part of a, an, an archipelago. Um, ooh. Lori says, when I think of uh, France, I think of Meritage and needs to eat there. Yes, Meritage is a really fantastic French restaurant in um, St. Paul. And one of the one of the hard parts about moving to the Kalamazoo area is that um, there's no really good French restaurant. I've, I've been super spoiled because I've lived in two places with amazing French restaurants, Denver, um, which had La Centrale, which was now closed, which was heartbreaking, but literally... One of the most wonderful little restaurants, and then Meritage, which is a French restaurant in St. Paul, also outstanding. You know, it's so, funny anyway. that Ann Arbor doesn't have a good French restaurant either. You know, it's funny because you know people don't really understand that you know French cuisine is just really yummy, specialized little. You know, and it's it's mm. and it's amazing how few French restaurants you see because I really think it's hard to do. I think it's it's hard for people just to to do French food mm -hmm. really well, especially to serve it to Americans because yeah, I, I think we're kind of lazy yeah a little bit <laughs> we're lazy with food so, uh, so anyway archipelago otherwise known as an island arc um it's, so what it is it's a group or a chain of islands uh and they're caused by several geologic things just and this is all tiny little 101 sort of stuff um they can be caused by things called hot spots which are um just you know essentially magma plumes right in the middle of a plate uh subduction zones which we'll talk about more in a minute um just erosion um, causing parts of uh, land masses to end up below sea level. Uh, and then they can be continental fragments, kind of like uh, England is pretty much considered a continental fragment of Europe. Um, so uh, the Tongan Iron uh, Arc is a result of subduction. So we'll talk a little bit about subduction. So what now? <laughs> so subduction, you guys, here's a quick 101 on subduction. Um, let's start with this. So here we have the planet Earth, and it's made of many layers. There's a crust, the one you're standing on, or we're doing whatever, skiing on, sleeping on, whatever. That's solid. Underneath that is the mantle, which is broken up into various layers. The two most prominent layers are the lithosphere, which is solid, and the asthenosphere, which is like plastic-like. So it's like a really hot, silly putty, which means it can flow, but it's not entirely liquid. Then underneath that, you have the outer core, which is liquid iron, so hot. And then the inner core, which is a solid iron core, which is so hot ass as well. And it's you know, it's kind of counterintuitive that you would have a solid if the temperatures that the, the inner core is, but there's so much pressure on it that it literally holds it into a solid state when it's hot enough, mm -hmm. you know, gaseous. I mean, really hot. So anyway, that's important when we're going to talk about subduction. But so is this idea that Earth's crust is broken into anywhere between eight and 15 plates, depending on who you talk to. Um, you have like eight really large major plates and then a bunch of little plates that are small. Um, and so what you're looking at here is the plate map. So Earth's continents are part of these plates. It just so happens that the continents are simply part, the part of the plate that's above sea level, but they're all, it's all one big plate. Um, what, you know, poor Alfred Wegener, when he was first proposing his theory of continental drift, but he had some, you know, weird idea about the continents plowing through the crust. He just didn't have the, 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 the understanding or the knowledge of the, you know, the, the ocean floor to understand that the continents are just part of a much larger plate system. And therefore he was, uh, you know, his theory of continental drift was rejected and he ended up dying in Greenland still trying to prove his theories. And yeah, there's a whole sad story there, but we won't get into it. Anyway. All of these plates are dynamic, meaning that they are in motion. And they are in motion uh, because of convection. Um, OK, so remember that time that I told you that the Earth's layers, the Earth's had a bunch of layers, remember, like two slides ago? Man, that was that's such a long time ago. Oh, yeah, I know, right? Uh, well, anyway, that's a big deal because um, 
the asthenosphere, which sits below the crust and the lithosphere, is sort of this semi-solid liquid thing, but it's liquid enough so that convection currents run through it. Um, and convection currents, you guys, are essentially a circular movement of any fluid, which can be a gas or a liquid, um, where you have material that rises away from its heat source and that starts to, because of the density change and then it's increasing. Lava lamp. Blah, 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 blah. Lava lamp, yes, thank you. So essentially, you guys, the earth, the interior of the earth is just a big ass lava lamp. And because of this convection, what happens is that the asthenosphere will drag the lithospheric plates, which is essentially the crust and the lithosphere together and will drag slash push them. Therefore, you have all of these moving plates. Now they move in different directions because these convection currents are moving in different directions. Okay, now's the part where I'm going to show you the cool gif. Can you see that? Cool gif alert. Wow. That's it's amazing. So cool. It really is amazing. So what you're looking at, um, you can see how convection essentially, and you can kind of see it here where it's um, forcing your various plates apart. And then all kinds of awesome stuff happens as a result of that. So that convection in the asthenosphere drives the movement of the lithospheric plates. And then those lithospheric plates, um, they have a relationship. They're interacting with each other in some way. So the plates are either pulling away from each other, known as divergence, which is happening in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Some of the plates are moving towards each other, which is called convergence, which is happening all over the, the Pacific Ocean. Um, and some are sliding past each other, which is called the transform boundary, which is what's happening at California. So California has the unfortunate geologic um, existence of being one state on two plates, part of it on the North American plate, the other part of the Pacific plate, which is awkward for Los Angeles and San Francisco and most of California. So that's why that's a really earthquake prone area. Um, yeah. And then you have this other interaction taking place with the North American plate and the Juan de Fuca plate, which is why you have all those volcanoes in, say, Washington State and Northern California and stuff like that. So, yeah. Anyway, there all that to say this. Um, remember that time when I was talking about subduction? Uh-huh. Yeah. I remember that. Subduction, you guys, and this is where we're getting to the stuff going on with Tonga, is that subduction can happen as a result of plates converging. Um, plates that are more dense than the other plate that they're interacting with will dive under the other plate, the less dense plate. That diving under one plate going under another plate is what we call subduction. And when subduction happens, um, you have one plate that dives down towards the much hotter center of the earth. That plate and the rock that makes up that plate melts into magma. Magma is much dense, dense than, less dense than the surrounding rock, so it starts to rise. And rising magma means volcano. Like a lava lamp. Oh my gosh, like a lava lamp. What? Wow. I know. It's like it's all interconnected. Like, you know, like like convection is like a foundational idea and that literally floats through of all, all of science. It does. Mm. I know it's a thing. Convection's a thing. So anyway, uh, as far as Tonga goes, the Tongan Island arc, you guys, is a result of subduction. You have the Pacific Plate and the Pacific Plate. And let's go. I'm going to go back in time here so you can see this. This map. Um when we're looking at this map, you can see the yellow Pacific plate, the big one in the middle. The Pacific plate, you guys, is essentially being subducted at all of its boundaries. It's being subducted um, underneath the Nazca plate. It's being subducted underneath the North American plate. It's being subducted under the, um, the Philippine plate, Austro, um, the Austro, Austrian or Austro, uh, Austro Indian plate. And as a result of that, you have this boundary around the Pacific Ocean, which is earmarked by both volcanoes and earthquakes. It's called the, the Ring of Fire. And it's not a coincidence that you have all of this activity around the Pacific Ocean. It's just the nature of what's happening geologically um, with the Pacific Plate. So you have the Tongan, that area, Tonga, the whole island arc sits right on that subduction zone. You have a massive trench that flows along um, Tonga. And then you have a, a large amount of volcanic activity right there along that trench. So, oops, I got to go back to this. That, that, that. So there you can see this picture of what Tonga looks like. And again, you can see it in this right here. There's this little square that you see is showing you that relationship between Tonga, the Pacific Plate, the Indo-Australian Plate, and all of the volcanoes that um, are a result of that. All right, so let's talk about the eruption that took place on January 14th and 15th of 2022. So the, the island itself was the Tongahunga Haape Volcano. Whew. Wow. Uh, and it's the interesting thing about that volcano is that it's not, it wasn't very old. That was a volcano uh, that really didn't start to emerge 
until about three or four years ago. So in terms of you know the age of that volcano, it was relatively young. And that's a testament to how active that boundary is as far as subduction, as far as subduction zones go. So you have this young volcano that started to show some activity on the 14th. Uh, and then on the 15th, it blew its top. So what you're seeing in this GIF um, is the satellite imagery of this eruption, where it was uh, incredibly explosive. So the thing that's interesting about this eruption is, in terms of its um, in terms of its violence, it was as it was as violent as the Pinatubo eruption in 1991, and it is the most violent eruption that's taken place on the planet since Pinatubo. Uh, 10 megatons is what NASA is saying it was, which is equivalent to 100 uh, Hiroshima's, which is ridiculous. Uh, and it's likely the loudest noise or the loudest sound on Earth since the Krakatoa eruption in 1883. There's a really great Twitter um, out there of a woman who just happened to be have her phone on and she was doing a recording of something and she actually caught that sound from 400 and some miles away. So and it's they heard it in Alaska, they heard it in other parts of the Pacific, they heard it in South America. So this was, um, this is a big one mm -hmm. as far as uh, really violent eruptions. Um, so in this eruption, guys, what's, this is one of those eruptions that they're gonna study for years. Um, there are what you would call like keystone events in geology. This is one of those events. Mount St. Helens is one of those events where they were able to get such interesting data from it that they've been studying Mount St. Helens for years as a way to help predict eruptions. In fact, they've actually used Mount St. Helens as a model for eruption prediction, which they successfully did with a volcano in the Bahamas about 10 years ago. So this eruption was weird, um, not only because it was the largest eruption in 30 years. Um, it One of the things that would, you would think that with a volcano with this level of violence, that it would have a much greater impact on the climate. But what they're seeing is that this volcano will not have an effect on the climate because it was short. It was incredibly explosive and then it stopped. So it's still active, but it's not actively erupting right now, which is which is weird because Pinatubo erupted for days and weeks. Mount St. Helens erupted for days. This eruption literally lasted 10 minutes. It blew its top and then it quit. So um, that's that in itself is really unusual for, for a volcano. The next thing that made it weird is this volcano produced tsunamis worldwide. Um, as far as tsunami, tsunamis, or for those that aren't familiar with that, it's a it, tsunami is a, it's it's the wave that if you have a, a violent disruption uh, in anything, it causes a wave of particles. In this case, the particles are moving through the water, and so. Anytime you have a large disruption of water, you basically move the ocean waves outward from that spot. It's very common in earthquakes, but not nearly as common for volcanoes to produce tsunamis. So I want to say it's like there have only been 100 tsunamis produced by volcanoes in the past 500 years, where other tsunamis are almost entirely produced by earthquakes. So what's weird about this one is not only did it produce um, a tsunami in the Pacific Basin, but it produced tsunamis in basins all over the world, which is almost unheard of. So I'll talk about why that was a thing in just a minute. So the shockwave, and that's part of the reason that this was, the shockwave itself reached 60 miles into the atmosphere at 600 miles an hour. And then the shockwave actually got pulled back down by gravity, which again is fascinating because what it did, it caused high and low pressure systems, which they actually think will might have a short-term effect on the climate. Um, specifically in affecting how the jet stream moves, which is which it will be interesting to watch in the coming months to see what kind of, of effect that has on, you know, just Pacific flow of air. Uh, so this oscillating shock wave, it's like, you know, most shock waves would just keep going up. This one went up and then it came back down. And then because of the way air moves on the planet with high pressure and low pressure, this wave just kept oscillating. And as a result of that, they think that's why it caused this massive, this massive set of tsunamis, not, not big tsunamis, you know, ba ocean basin wise, but enough to know that there was definitely a change in ocean levels because of this uh, eruption, because it was all over the world. It was just pushing up and down on the water, which again, is going to cause that tsunami effect to take place, which again, that's um, so again, they th scientists believe that this eruption was weird because of its depth and it just, um, one of the, when I was reading, one of the scientists talked about it as like the plumbing that allows magma to, to come to the surface. 
Uh, and what happened is that you had a change in the plumbing that started this volcano four or five years ago, and then a change in the plumbing that started actively disrupting the volcano on January 14th, and that opened enough so that all this cold seawater could rush into this, this plumbing and then basically set off a steam explosion, so to speak. So the depth of this volcano was also one of the things that created the explosiveness of it, meaning that it was just at the right depth, about 500 feet, so that there was enough water to get in to start the steam eruption and make it incredibly explosive, but not enough water to cap it and keep this explosion from happening. So it was just enough to, like if you have a, a pressure cooker that it blows up. So it's kind of like that. So a deeper eruption probably would have muted um, the explosiveness of the eruption and um, a, a, a cone that was above sea level wouldn't have had this rushing in of water. And so you probably would have had a fairly sedate eruption rather than this incredibly explosive eruption. So what were they calling it? This is a Goldilocks eruption. But um, so you can kind of see these three pictures. This is what uh, the, the volcano looked like before. Then a few days before the, the big eruption, um, just a couple of hours. That's what the middle picture is. Just a couple of hours, we see that the sea has covered this volcano. So there's a tiny collapse in the caldera. And then that final picture is January 18th, a couple of days after the eruption. And you, as you can see, there's just nothing left of the island. It literally just, it just blew up. So um, this was a devastating uh, volcano for the islands close by, for those uh, the, the main islands of Tong Tonga. And this was caused by not only the four foot tsunami that came across the island, um, but also because of the extensive ash fall. And one of the things you have to understand about volcanic ash is we have this uh, mental model of ash as being this lightweight stuff, like when you burn wood or paper. Volcanic ash is not wood or paper. Volcanic, volcanic ash is tiny granules of rock. So when you have a piling up of volcanic ash, it's incredibly dense and very heavy and very damaging to uh, machinery, planes, um, cars. It, it can, you know, it can crush houses because if you only need a depth of a few inches to start taking down houses and roofs and structures. So volcanic ash, and that's why a number of years ago when they had that big volcanic um, eruption in Iceland, why planes were working so hard to stay away from this ash cloud because you have you know, imagine tiny bits of rock going through a jet en engine and what that's going to do to a jet engine. It's going to completely destroy it. So that's one of the reasons that this um, this has been so devastating is that you have tons of ash, you have water damage um, in a country that is not really equipped to handle that sort of um, that sort of disaster because this is, you know, Tonga is not a rich nation by any stretch of the imagination. So yeah, anyway, that's what's, that's what's happening with this particular eruption. It was it was devastating. Uh, it was um, incredibly explosive, and it was like I said, just really unusual as far as volcanic eruptions go. So yeah, no, that was um, you know, and you forget like I forget that about ash. I'm like, oh yeah, that's not paper ash. That's rock ash. I mean, that's so hard. That's so hot that it melts rock. I'm like, oh mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And then that rock cools into little tiny bits of rock. And that's, unlike I said, that's the one, that's, uh, that's the, you know, so we, we talk about, you know, the, here in, in, in America, we have uh, the, the impending disaster of the, uh, of the super volcano of Yellowstone. That's the one everybody likes to think about, but that would be, and that's one of the reasons it would be such a devastating eruption is that you're kicking out ash that would devastate entire ecosystems because mm -hmm. of its density, because of its, you know, its makeup. Yeah. No, but so yeah, that's some, um, you know, your your geology nerdness for for today is is this eruption. So if you're curious as to why everybody keeps talking about it, that's why because it's in the scientific community. This is a really, this is a really interesting event, and it's one of those events that scientists are going to study the the unique nature of this of this volcanic eruption. Plus, you know, volcanoes they just don't happen all that often. They don't, and uh, you don't have a, a sense of what they do or you know, one minute, everything's fine. And five minutes later, everything is absolutely not fine. And that's kind of the way it works in nature is that you don't, you know, and the, the difficulty with volcanic eruptions and earthquakes is that they're hard to predict. Scientists have gotten so much better. And like I said, Mount St. Helens made a huge difference in, in terms of how scientists study volcanic activity, what to look for, changes in volcanic activity, changes in heat, changes in, you know, um, 
you know, tilt up the crust. And that's one of the things that they do in Yellowstone. That's part of the Yellowstone is one of the most awesome ongoing geologic studies in the world right now, because there's so much for them to look at it and study. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, it's more than just a great place to take your family. That's right. If you knew what you were walking around on when you're at Yellowstone, you might not walk around there so readily. Yeah, you might be place. like, oh, this might be, isn't this dangerous? Oh, it's like a volcanic, volcanic caldera. Active. Active. Volcanic caldera. <laughs> Very active. Yeah. No crap. <laughs> so, so yeah, that, but anyway, that's from been kind of following that and waiting for the, I'm waiting for all the, the journals to come out about this one because I really think yeah. there's a lot to learn. And it's really just been interesting to hear scientists speculate as to why they think this was such an unusual event. Yeah. So I'm sure there's, I'm sure they'll find things that are like, oh man, I didn't even know that. Exactly. This is going to be one of those things that they will study. And then again, what's important when it comes to the study of this is that they're going to take this information and continue to apply it you know, we're so much better at earthquake and um, especially volcano prediction than we were 50 years ago or 40 years ago. Because what, Mount St. Helens was what, 1980? 1980, yeah. We are in 2022. So, you know, it's amazing what we learned from that eruption. Yeah. 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 So uh, if you'd like to know more, um, we can, we'll put some links on, uh, I think uh, both um, NASA and National Public Radio have done some really interesting, mm -hmm. um, I think uh, Guardian 2 has a really great, uh, kind of summation of, of what happened with the eruption as well. There you go. Yeah. Perfect. Um, so. Yeah, I know I've gotten most of my information from NPR on the recent, you know, volcanic activity. I was like, oh, wow. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. So. There you go. There you have, there you have it. Mm -hmm. Geology, plate geology 101. Hopefully you can learn some new words such as subduction, subduction. convergence, divergence. Convection. <laughs> I'll have an exit for all of you to complete and then make sure you get that turned in via Google Forms. <laughs> Not a map. Duncan, did you hear that? Get to work on your homework. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. So here you go. So, cool. so uh, next week, um, Anna and I are going to be doing our own research. Yes. Because that's what everybody does now. Uh, we're going to be doing our own research on the documentary Julia, and we'll also be we're going to watch the documentary, and then we're going to go to. Did we decide was it Principal or Rustica that we're going to? I thought it was Principal. Principal in Kalamazoo yeah. to eat food and to talk to you, uh, and then we'll have a review of both in our uh, in our coming episode. So exactly. not next week because next week next week we have to do our own research. Exactly, and we have to research. So if you want to, please, it's on. Um, it's on Prime right now. It's one of those, um, you know, early release sort of things. So you can, you know, pay the fee and watch it. So if you want to watch Julia, the documentary about um, about Julia Childs, you can certainly do that so that you will be ahead of the game when we discuss it. And then That's take right. yourself out to some really nice restaurant afterwards. That's right. Because if you're going to watch a, a documentary about Julia Child, you have to be prepared to eat both before, during, and after said documentary. Exactly. In fact, I'm going to Kalamazoo next week so we can watch it together because Jenny's got a big ass TV. And I, I was thinking about, ooh, what food am I going to bring? <laughs> oh, I know. I, that's why I'm, I'm like, I'm, I'm looking forward to it so much. I'm like, eat, 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 eat. Charcuterie yeah. plate. Oh, charcuterie, charcuterie yo. <laughs> <laughs> So, so yeah, so there you go. More smart, dumb. So yeah, we did smart stuff this week. Next week we're going to do, I don't even know if I would call next week dumb stuff. It's dumb fun stuff. stuff. We're doing fun stuff next week. Yeah, we're doing, so we're doing smart stuff. We're doing fun stuff. And then uh, we'll come back with something dumb. I think, um, I think the dumb thing we're going to do, don't, is that we're trying to figure out what is the most 80s song of the 80s. Not and I'm going to I'm gonna have to come up with a top five list. That I think, and then I will find, and then I'll have like, it'll be more like a top six list. So the, the five, and then the one that I think is the because there's, I've been thinking about this a lot, and um, I think I have mine narrowed down to number one, but I have it. It's tough. It's tough. It's so tough. So know that that's, uh, that's coming as well. The, so yeah, so two weeks from today, you guys will be back with our uh, review of, uh, Documentary Julia and uh, the delicious restaurant uh, principal of um, Kalamazoo. And then after that, we're going to hit you with some 80s tunage and maybe some Muppets because we still haven't. Have we done our Mount Rushmore Muppets yet? If not, not. Okay. Yeah. If not. No. And that's, um, you know, 
you know, I think like when we do our, our, our 80s, I'm mean, going to have like my five personal 80s songs that I feel like, you know, made an impact on me the most in the 80s. And then the one that I consider the most quintessential 80s song. I think we might need to bring our music experts, Jim and Tammy, into this one as well. I don't know why we wouldn't. So. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, Jim and Tammy, if you're out there listening, you know, we're coming at you exactly. with your most 80 song of the 80s. They were definitely that's the entire decade. That's not like 85 to 81 or no, 86 to 9. No, this is, you get one. Yeah. So. And I was going to say, in the 80s are a. Yeah. 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 It's a landmine, people. A lot <laughs> happened to music in the 80s. <laughs> You know, both good and bad. So, yeah. <laughs> so, but anyway, Duncan uh, has some opinions. So, yeah, Duncan, we grew up in some very different well. worlds in the '80s. So, Duncan has some very distinct um, opinions that uh, and contempt for uh, much '80s music. <laughs> he had cool older brothers. Oh. And we just had U93 out of South Bend. Out so. of South Bend, yeah. So he's like <laughs> listening to the cool college rad music of the early right. 80s. And like, and we weren't, we were listening to everything that was on Casey's Top 40. <laughs> exactly. So he has a little bit of contempt for it. Yeah, yeah. whatever. Oh. You know, Duncan's pretentious. He's remarkably pretentious. Yeah. About Duncan very pretentious. specific things. Beer, <laughs> music, and the type of hat he wears. So. Okay. <laughs> Everything else is pretty chill about, but those things, <laughs> definite opinions. Hmm. Totally He's like, mm, well. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right. That's well, it. ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us on this fine Sunday, the last Sunday of January, 2022. Yep. And tomorrow is the fifth Monday. Fifth Monday. January, 2022. I know we got jammed with five Mondays this January. Really? January's not hard enough without making five Mondays out of it. Come on. seems like it's been the 28th of January for like all month. Like, this literally oh. has been, this, this month has been the longest year of my life. It really exactly. has. It's like, oh, so done. It's like, oh, yay, it's gray and snowy today. Oh, great. It's yay, gray and snowy. Oh, it, it, it's, it's six degrees today. It's 26 degrees. I'm not going with a coat today. I know. I'm just going to wear a big sweatshirt today. <laughs> so vitamin D deficient. It's not even I know. Right. I, I like my students, like one of my students just looked at me the other day and he's like, Miss Brothers, are you okay? And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I know I look tired, Pacey, but this is, this is my winter look. I suppose I could do something about that, but I'm not gonna, I, I, I take vitamin D. Is that it? I don't even know what to do. I'm like, I've got seven layers on. Literally, I'm wearing seven layers of clothes. I don't even know what my skin looks like anymore. I'm pretty sure I've been shaved. I don't know. I haven't looked that hard. Uh, like, why would you bother? I know. Well, that's like one more layer, you know? Yeah. So, mm -hmm. I just can't even. I'm like, oh, that's funny. Yeah. Else. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Well, anyway. January close. You know, okay, and there's one other nice thing about February is that, and I can't remember the name of the phenomenon, but you gain, you start to gain, like in January, December and January, when you gain light, you gain like a minute or two a day. In February, you start to gain anywhere from two to four minutes of light a day. So it's like, it's one of those months where you gain light faster than other months. And I can't, there's a name for it. I don't remember the name of the phenomenon, but it's awesome. I know. I was going to say, I'll take it. I will take yeah. it. Yes. So yeah, I look. I do this dumb thing. I, I and when I get up in the, every morning and I'm looking at my weather stuff, I always look to see what time the sunrise and the sunset are. So I have great news, you guys. We've broken eight o'clock for sunrise, so we are pre eight o'clock now for sunrise. Yeah. <laughs> the little things. Little things make big things. That's all I know. So. So that's it's coming. Spring is coming. It will be here before we know it. Oh, hey, I need to talk to you about turkey vultures after we're done here. Oh, that's right, because we're going to go see the – oh, which reminds me, I have to make hotel reservations. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, we're going to go do – we're going to uh, – in was that's in March, right? March, yes. In March, we're going to do a, a live a live broadcast uh, from – what's it called? Hinkley, Ohio. Hinkley, Ohio. 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 Uh, round uh, – high in the middle and round on both ends. Ohio. Um, why was the Jesus born in Ohio? Why? Because they couldn't find a three wise men's or a virgin. <laughs> we're going to get emails. I know. We're gonna, like, we're going to get letters. <laughs> um, so, yeah, anyway. All right. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, again, thanks for joining us. Uh, happy last Sunday and happy last. We're going to celebrate tomorrow ahead of time. Happy last day of January. Um, if it snows this week, get your shovels ready. Get your snowblowers ready. You got this.
All right, guys. You're a massage therapist because you're going to pull a muscle. I can help you. Yes. <laughs> Stretch first, get warmed up. Don't just tackle that snow. All right. Or hire a local team to shovel for you mm -hmm. if you can. Helping the economy. Mm -hmm. Indeed. All right, guys. Peace. All Look, right. there's a kitty in the background. Hi, Bobo. Yeah, <laughs> Here's my butthole. Isn't it pretty? It's pink. <laughs> no. awesome. It's really good to be one of your cats. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Have a great day, everybody. Bye. Yeah.